Isra is a busy professional who cares about her self-development and education. Let's see what happens when she is called by her friend leading her to make a crucial decision about how she would spend the rest of her day. Hey! Yeah, oh my god, I completely forgot. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. Well, there just aren't enough hours in the day. I've still got to squeeze in the workout and I really want to finish that book I was telling you about. Wait, how can you read while you're working out or even while driving? That sounds pretty dangerous. Huh, story tell. So I can listen to the book while I'm working out? That's exactly what I need. I'll download the app now. Be like Isra. Weasel your way towards what you want to do and what you need to achieve. Download Storytel today and never waste a moment without an educating book playing in the background. You can find the Storytel link in the description. Now, let's start the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Hamburger Generation, Jeel El Hamburger. Today's storyteller is Nidal Murra. He talks to us about his experience with ADHD, how he felt different growing up and his unique story of how he came to realize that he's not exactly like everyone else. Enjoy this fruitful story and conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you you, li- so you much. listen, right? Like yes, listen yes, and, and I laugh a lot. Good, good stuff. Um, and I do have the classic moment where uh, listening in the car, you get to the place and you don't want to go down to, to the meeting uh, because you want to finish the rest of the story. Like You don't want to pause it in the middle. Oh, man, that's a good uh, feedback. Right? <laughs> that's a good feedback. Yeah. But you got you to gotta be on time with the meetings too. So, yeah, I struggle with this. Even if I even if I prepare to leave on time and follow everything, I just manage to somehow get distracted along the way and and be late to stuff. And it wasn't till I was like 30 until I finally realized with the help of professionals why this was happening to me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys really want to hear about how I got diagnosed with ADHD, but that for me really transformed everything. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of aha moments, including like being late for stuff. Like I used to think I was just a lazy person or, Mm -hmm. you know, you build these things in your head that you absorb from uh, the environment. I kind of imagine had I known before or when I was a kid, how things would have been different. But uh, there's no really uh, a great use of dwelling on the past. But it was it was a funny story, actually. What happened? Um, so I always seek adrenaline. Like I want to look for things that excite me, things that get the blood going, a lot of novelty, thrill-seeking behavior, to the point that I was getting in trouble. Like growing up, I, I was naughty because I was almost painfully bored Mm. and that's one of the symptoms that in hindsight was a big aha like that makes sense Mm. and back then imagine telling your parents you know you're a child you're like i'm really bored it's not gonna sound like a really serious thing yeah it's like get over it yeah they try to fill your time like here read some books Mm. and but my earliest most vivid memory is just being so intensely bored that, <laughs> that I would be weighed down by it and lay down on the rug at home um, and just kind of force my imagination to stimulate me in some way. Because mm. I was young enough not to be allowed to go play outside. Both my parents worked. And I had someone at home with me to, to watch me and make sure that I'm okay. But and, and a full library of books that I had access to, but I couldn't read. So I would just fantasize, like infinitely fantasize, and build these scenarios and, and characters and fill a world with detail and then find myself in it and start going on kind of adventures. It's not imaginary friends. It's like a place that I go in my head. Cool. So over time, that slowly morphed into me 
referencing these stories and pulling them into my life um, and entertaining people. You know, I became kind of like a Hakawati character with, with friends. And from that, I learned early on how to be a really creative liar. And I would kind of like test the adults around me to see like how much I can get away with. And that was my transformative uh, uh, skill set that took me to naughty boy. Mm. And naughty to the point of like getting in trouble with the law, you know. Mm. Uh, do things that are like on the edge of breaking the law somehow. Police would pick me up and they would call my parents. They're like, do you know what your kid is doing? Mm. They're like, Yes. He's at Zaid's house mm. with full trust. <laughs> and then they're like, well, come pick him up because he was spraying up some walls. <laughs> and and th these things you would do, is it because of like the continuation of the lack of boredom? Are you doing it because you're bored or are you doing it just because you want the rush? So it's kind of a mix of both. I don't want to say I was a gifted child, but because I had so much time, I would read things and study things and look at them and... By the time I, I got to school, I kind of already knew a lot of these things. Mm. So I wouldn't pay attention and I would fuss around and distract others. So I was labeled as naughty kid. And, you know, it, it didn't leave. It stayed with me. But I started to fit it into uh, social behavior and, and be naughty kind of like in context mm. to the point where I literally like became a clown where, you know, in university... I found my way into the performing arts program and I found, uh, like, with with the help of uh, my instructor, Anthony Tassa, we, like, we started putting a play together where we literally get to act out all these energies within a structure. So uh, as I grew, the, these impulses were guided into structured behavior, but I still had that thing. Mm. And I would you know, drive quickly, like I crashed the car because of that, just to feel something like edge of law just above the speed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I, I would look for uh, was thrills. And one of them, I started to learn skydiving. I'd worked on a TV show where we filmed an episode at, at uh, skydive and I was just fascinated. I'm like, what do you mean you jump out of a plane? What do you mean you do that for fun? I was so curious. I wanted to experience it myself. Mm. And I didn't want to be strapped to someone because I felt like that was kind of cheating. So I went, I took the classes, and I would do it so early in the morning that I would be done by like 9.30 and I would go to work. Like that's how I would start my day. Oh, wow. Go <laughs> learn ground school, how to control these things. And by like day three, all the theory is done. You've done all the tests. You've tried everything out. It's the day to jump. And the day to jump came. And rather than be scared, I was looking forward to it all the way up to when you arrive at the door where you literally now have to jump. And in that instant, everything I knew, everything I was told about what I'm supposed to do disappeared from my head. And I felt real kind of fear. And... Behind you, there's a whole bunch of other students waiting their turn. And each one has like two instructors who are going to jump with them and kind of like hold mm -hmm. on to them until you open your parachute. Uh -huh. And I was holding it up because there's like lights that come up. And when green comes, you have a few seconds before you do or you miss the mark. And everything in your body is telling you not to do it. <coughs> yeah. Your whole evolution is saying, oh, jump. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to find that thing in you where it's like, do it anyway. And that impulse for thrill-seeking was the thing that helped me. And mm. all of a sudden, I found myself falling through the sky. My heart was beating out of my chest. I was actually wearing a heart monitor. It reached almost 199 beats per minute. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it takes a minute in free fall before you're supposed to open your parachute. And in that minute, your instructors are testing you to see if they're going to let you do this again, if they're going to give you more freedom. And there's signals and stuff, and I don't remember any of this, but I did everything. Right. Open your parachute. Now they can't hang out with you. They have to leave. You right. Open your parachute. There's a radio built into the helmet where they start to guide you how to make your way back. But you're driving it. It's not just random. You're descending, and you, you're supposed to hit a certain mark. First one, I hit it. It's amazing. I fell. Everything's covered in sand. I was exhilarated. I was hooked. 
And then I kept doing that. I, I, I kept doing the lessons. I got my A license. We're talking like 30 jumps in. There isn't a day that they're open that I don't go in the morning. 30 jumps in, 35 jumps in, something like that. I'm in that spot. My heart is pumping. I'm at the door. No more instructors. I'm licensed, jumping by myself. Get out of it and free fall. You have like a minute mm -hmm. of absolute craziness where you literally, you get to fly. And the, the way you move your body takes you places. You can even delay yourself or fall faster. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what started to happen was within these 60 seconds, I started to to feel bored i no started way. to look at my altimeter that tells me how far i still have to fall and almost like wondering like how long is this gonna take like that was the thought in my head like, <laughs> when am i gonna like open my parachute and get you're so over it get it over with like this uh -huh. so i landed and i went back in gave my shoot up and i it stuck with me i get to work i get back home and I start telling my wife, Farah, uh, Farah Sharif, shout out. She's an awesome photographer. Shout Hi, out. Farah. <laughs> I start telling her the story of what happened. Mm. And she listens intently and she's like, I think you should talk to someone about this. Mm. That's all she said. Mm. And a couple of days later, she gives me a few numbers. She's like, there's this path, uh, which is, you know, speaking therapy path. There's the path of uh, psychiatry. But just have a look. Speak to a professional. See if there if this indicates anything right and it was such a strange thing to experience that i'm like i should probably like had you never ever spoken to a professional before about this kind of feeling or urge do you have because i i guess i always reasoned it within what was happening you know i would say like i'm having an off day or the task is too difficult uh but this one was odd yeah, this that was like, like a, a pretty splinter you know like kind yeah. Of thing. yeah <laughs> you know getting bored doing the most exciting thing that you've done okay so you you f sorry you followed up with the numbers like yeah i called the number made an appointment went to the place told him the story and immediately he's like i think i think i have an inkling this indicates da 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 and he gave me a couple of tests that i did and forms for my family, like my mom and dad, brother and sister, uh, questions about the past, things like that, a couple of blood tests, put all that stuff together, come back a week later, and he sits me down, he's like, I'm going to tell you something that's going to uh, make you feel a lot better. This is going to help you so much. And then he tells me, he explains kind of what ADHD is, and the misconceptions people have about it and why I might believe it or not and so on. So he tells me the details and I, you know, take them in and it took me a few days to really process it. But with this new knowledge and reflecting upon the things that happened, things started to make a bit more sense. And then I would ask, what should I do in this situation? What should I do in that situation? And I would get like homework. I would get tasks and all that did was help guide us into the specificity of what I'm experiencing. And because there's all kinds of, of ways it could manifest. And it's, it's, it's a spectrum kind of uh, on the same spectrum as autism, but mm. uh, there's overlaps basically. So okay. it's good to know which flavor mm -hmm. you have, right? And we got close to that. And then we came up with a plan where I speak to somebody uh, like CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, uh, plus medication if I wanted to it was elective and I thought I would try it and at first I was resisting it a bit but now it feels like all the things that were obstacles for me that I used to struggle with and blame myself kind of or blame the environment or sometimes like my parents blame them instead now it's like okay if I just trace it back that's where it is mm. and it's a process of catching it almost every day and getting better at recognizing uh what things are me and what things are it and not letting it take over but now it feels like now it feels like i gained almost like a superpower mm -hmm. because when it comes to the work that i do and storytelling and writing and imagination then i can take all these skills that i picked up coping with adhd 
and pour them on this topography, uh, this kind of like structure that I have. So it became it became something that enhanced my life and actually got me to a point where I would use it to live better in a way. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you use it to your own benefit? Yeah, yeah. And did you ever go down the road of like medication? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. Um, I was, I didn't want it mm. initially because mm. I felt like that means I'm broken or that means that there's something missing or that means that it's a crutch or something outside of myself that I need to be who I am. But it's a tool. It's just like the glasses. If we need something to correct our vision, I'm not ashamed of wearing glasses or it's not part of my identity that I am or... And in worst case scenarios, they break or whatever. I can still live and survive without them. At least I know that there's something in my vision to correct, yeah. you know? Yeah. So with medication, I was resistant initially. And then all the doctor said was like, try it and you can stop whenever you want. And my biggest concern was things that build up in your system that then you have to taper <laughs> off. Luckily, uh, right. the medicine I use is, is not like that. You can just take it every day um, and stop when you don't need to or if adverse effects come in well, uh, is it is it med medication like ritalin and the adderall yeah stuff yeah, like yeah. That? yeah okay it's uh the ritalin as it's branded as uh, the same chemical basically but it's called concerta mm. uh, oh. and it's not adderall is uh, it hits you all at once this one is coded so it releases a bit slowly oh. so you start to figure out how your body's dealing with it and you i almost have like a timetable now like i know after 10 o'clock i'm not going to take it because it's going to uh, uh move the day forward right, right. Mm. Yeah. yeah 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 and it affects uh, your sleep it does initially yeah mm. and it, what i'm saying is how it works for me yeah. things like this are um specific to each person of course. i get blood work done uh, so things are monitored But the, the biggest thing that I um, got from the medication is it doesn't do anything for you, right? All it does is kind of like, if I'm going to use a visual metaphor, turn up the brightness in a dark room so you can see everything. You still have the choice of where to put your attention and focus, right? right? But before the medication, it's almost like being in a dim room where you're Uh, constantly figuring things out by touch mm. almost missing an entire thing that uh, neurotypical people have and and that thing is called executive function executive function is uh, basically the secretary general of your brain it sits right here and it tells you the the things you have to do the things you don't have to do respecting time uh, controlling attention focus prioritizing that part That office in my brain is empty. There's no one sitting there doing that. <laughs> Unless you take the yeah, medication. There's, it, even with the medication, all it does is kind of like tell everybody else in the office, like the boss is not here. Mm. By the way, the <laughs> boss is not here. So they're on more alert to figure things out autonomously in a way. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So you're just more alert, really. Um, I know when i'm being distracted or okay. i know you're more like self-aware yeah in a way yeah that's that's one way that it helps another one is that it just um makes the high speed rush of information kind of filtered and that's where the crossover between adhd and autism happens it's it's about stimulation it's not that we don't have enough attention to focus on one thing rather Everything is equally important. You're looking at everything rather than focusing on that one thing while everything is hitting you. Taking it all uh, in. Uh -huh. And uh, there are points in time where it gets distracting. For instance, we're sitting here, we're having a conversation. I would start to, for instance, notice the sound of the light bulbs. Slowly, I would start to notice it. And then because it's loud and stimulates that part of me, then I, I'm not going to pay attention to the rest of the conversation. Right, so that's yeah. one way it, it could be. 
like Man Uche running around. Man Uche running around then becomes infinitely interesting, mm. right? <laughs> um, and not saying that it isn't. Almost everything is infinitely interesting, and that's the perspective that I had. Yeah. Um, and I still maintain is that everything is infinitely in- interesting, but the conscious experience then allows us to be selective. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was just mind blown by everything. Always curious and not taking more than 10 steps in a singular direction. Knowing this, with or without medication, I can just always reorient and say like, hang on a second, this is the place where you need to go, this is how to aim, right? So the medication makes the aiming uh, more smooth or more frequent. Interesting. (laughs) That's, yeah. That was I such a good if, description. I wonder I've if there's like someone. a reverse medication. I'm almost curious to know what it is that you had gone through. Like I'm almost like curious to know what is it like to have equal interest or like three, like a 360 of equal curiosity about everything around me. So it is, it is the, uh, there is a way for you to experience that, right? And, and it's a, it's a chemical way to experience that. But then, you're altering your consciousness, right? right? It is possible for you to alter your consciousness in a way that would simulate what it's like not to have executive function. Mm. Yeah. What drug do I have to be on? It's, uh, I would say a lot of psychedelics do that. Mm. Mm. They do it in a way. What they do is they stop filtering things. They allow for all the different parts of your brain all usually neurons that don't usually speak to each other now suddenly can then you start to experience a a crossover of uh, lack of executive function synesthesia uh, senses crossing over meaning appearing out of uh, noise basically pattern recognition gets jacked up so a lot of these things were happening just as regular life and I, i would be kind of surprised when i check with others that this is not what you see. For instance, my astigmatism. When I was younger, I didn't know that there was something wrong. I would just see like each light would have streaks coming out of it. Yeah. Certain letters, even if it's just black and white, look a bit offset with like the TikTok logo, blue and yeah, red yeah. on one side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would describe that to my friends just as kids when we were drawing in class. And they're like, what are you talking about this is black and white (laughs) so then i would internalize that and be weirded out by like okay so we don't experience the same Uh yeah and then i would complain to my parents like my friends are making fun of me you know and go to the optometrist and check my eyes and it's like oh there's astigmatism and then i put these on and it's like ah that's how you see there's no streaks on the light (laughs) things are sharp (laughs) this is the world (laughs) It's kind of like that. Yeah. yeah, I actually have a story about uh, one of those like study pills. I mean, back in university, they would call them study pills or something. Anyway, so I <laughs> had an exam. Why did you get pills. all weird? Oh, I mean, oh. <laughs> stimulants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever they are. <laughs> so uh, I was studying for an accounting exam that I had hadn't been like catching up on uh, during university. I was I felt like I was screwed. Like the exam was like tomorrow, and I didn't study. Anyway, I was just spending the whole day. I was like, the whole day is going to be me studying from early morning till night. So I was studying and I felt like I was getting nowhere. And I told one of my roommates, he's like, don't worry, man, I got you. Mm. And he gave me an Adderall pill. Mm. I was like, oh, what is this? He's like, just take it. It'll make you, it'll help you focus and it'll help you like beat down on the book like during the whole night. And then you go in the morning for your exam, you'll be good. I'm like, okay. So I took it. And man, what a what an experience! <laughs> I did the mistake of going on Wikipedia Uh-oh. and clicking on that random button. Do you know about the random button on Wikipedia? You just click on this button and it'll open a random Wikipedia page, and you learn all about that topic. Goodbye, the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, man. I was like, next, <laughs> read the whole thing. Next, I learned so much about chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, yeah eventually but nothing for the test uh, eventually i studied and then mm. passed mm. you described hyper focus yeah yeah that's like the extreme i guess that's hyper focus and that's something that with adhd with or without medication you get to sometimes experience mm. and hyper focus shows itself in things that are uh, they call them medically special interest right 
uh, autistic people have um, one of the things that are more known about it is having a special interest. For instance, I had a friend when I was young who loved trains and anything to do with trains, <laughs> regardless of what, uh, how dismissive of a detail it may sound to you, to him was the absolute peak of pleasure learning. Like the width of the gauge in this track versus that track and whether it's mounted reversible or no, all the way into the type of light bulbs that go in the kind of coach. So things like that, I've experienced that without the Adderall, where I, I would find something when I was uh, you know, younger and, and get stuck in that world until I've squeezed every iota of information about that thing. And the minute I realize, okay, now I know, I do not care anymore. Khalas, it's gone. Mm. It's gone. I get like three days of hyper focus with this thing and then mm. it's finished. <laughs> Whoa. You're kind of describing uh, like two of my siblings, to be honest. Oh, wow. Now, now that I think about it. Uh-huh. Fajr and Mojo definitely display a lot of these characteristics. Yeah. Of like the vortexing into a topic. Yeah. YouTube videos nonstop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mo, definitely, yeah. حلقة اليوم برعاية Storytel Storytel هو تطبيق تقدر تسمع منه لآلاف من الكتب الصوتية باللغة العربية والإنجليزية عبر التطبيق تقدر تسمع بدون ما يكون جوالك مشبوك على النت ويمكنك تسريع القراءة ووضع علامة لحفظ المكان اللي بتوقف عنده عشاق جيل الهامبرجر لهم رمز مخصص في صندوق الوصف بيعطيك فترة تجريبية لمدة 14 يوم حملوا تطبيق ستوري تيل وجربوه عبر اللينك في صندوق الوصف وهلا خلينا نرجع لقصتنا yeah. Do you have a vortex that you ever went into? I'm I'm not I'm not very vortexy. Mm. No. I feel like what is the opposite of being focused on something? Uh-huh. I feel like I have that. Perceiving everything <laughs> yeah. at once. That's a slot. Not not necessarily perceiving everything at once like I don't have extreme interest in anything it's more like perceiving nothing (laughs) (laughs) like like i don't necessarily feel like super passionate about something so if if you were uh, uh, you you get like a -a make-a-wish foundation kind of uh uh, opportunity okay yeah. you get to ask for something or meet someone or what would you do in that situation it'd be kind of hard actually so there's not even a singer that you listen to enough to want to meet i i don't have an extreme interest in anything <laughs> she would tell them don't burden me with these wishes <laughs> like i would i'd probably like wish something for other people like I'd be like, oh, oh end good. world hunger or something like that. Yeah. Like I, I, I can't find something inside me that I would be like, I love this thing so much. Wow. You Except know? your kids, of course. That's, that's yeah. And my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's nothing that I'm like, like as in like, I'm, I'm thinking like, because you're talking about football. Yeah. You're talking about like your interest of like wanting to do like crazy rebellious things and the adrenaline and all that. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, is there something that like I'm super passionate about? Food. You you like to eat food. I mean, yeah, but I'm also like, eh, about uh, food. Uh, yeah, she's not reviewing it, or mastering yeah, a recipe. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, if yeah, I was, true. if I like, if if I want to take it down to the, like the dumbest denominator here, if I was an Instagram influencer, <laughs> what would my angle be? Like I feel like I have no angle in my life. Like maybe Jimmy has got. You know, you got like the soccer angle, you got the poetry hood thing, you know. I don't think I have an angle. Oh. Parenting. You you went into parenting, didn't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Give me something else. Yeah, you do parenting and the uh, design. Didn't you like write a paper about like design and stuff? The PhD. The angle thing? if you were an Instagram influencer <laughs> is Kill yourself. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I exist? <laughs> like, I mean, even if I think about like things that I studied, yeah, fine. I have a bachelor's in design. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And you don't yeah, care about I design? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I like it. Mm. I'm not like killing myself over it. 
And then I did the masters in like sustainable sustainability and sustainable design. Yeah, that's good. Mm. I'm doing PhD in education. I'm like, okay, like that. Like I'm not like oh, I love education. <laughs> like I'm not that. What if that's the angle? My angle is that I got no yeah. angle. Casual excellence. Yeah. Yeah. Saying, pretty, pretty <laughs> casual cool. living yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, it like, that's it yeah, just yeah have maybe a just like neutral yeah, just, you know, like that's my thing neutrality casual, casual i'm raising living. three kids yeah it's okay. exactly yeah 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 because yeah. sometimes i go like okay what's my like r- religious perspective on this thing and i'm like oh yeah it could be this it could be that <laughs> like whatever like i got no uh, yeah i got no oomph about things you're uh, passionate about agnosticism about being agnostic about yeah. things yeah yeah. I mean, mm, maybe. that's even your handle for that uh, influencer Instagram, the passionate <laughs> the, uh, agnostic. That was just an example. I'm not <laughs> the really passion of the agnostic. <laughs> yes. The passion of the agnostia. Okay. Okay. That's my thing. Anyways, that no. was like my own self diagnosis. Now, like now I want to see what the posts look like on this <laughs> page. Posts are going to be like <laughs> sitting. Like in the most amazing place. Like, mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The Eiffel is. You know, like really? how every influencer has I'm the picture of their newborn. She's yeah. like, I guess I made it. Do- yeah, oh caption. No, I feel like you guys are describing my life right now. <laughs> like, I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah. Like, like an hour after I had the baby, I'm like, okay, yeah. Oh, wow. That, I mean, that's really cool. So this is, this is a cool character to put in absolutely extreme situations, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like the podcast. The mm. podcast is good. Like if uh, if someone comes with a gun at you, like give me all your money. I guess you can have it oh, all. What? Fine. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, now, put like the gun with, down. I'll do with, it. <laughs> now with Bitcoin, everyone's kind of like freaking out. Like Bitcoin is crashing and stuff. I have a lot of money in Bitcoin. I'm like, yeah, I guess it'll crash. So you're a hodler. I'm a hodler. Hodler. Oh uh, like yeah, yeah. Like I'm not. I'm not one selling. One of those people holding. Not yeah, selling. yeah. I'm not selling for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just like, yeah, I guess it'll go down and go up. Like, whatever. <laughs> and I, like, I see, like, Mo, like, oh, my life! Oh! And I'm like, oh, man, yeah, he's really passionate about this. <laughs> yeah. Do you mind that you don't have this? I mean, now that I'm aware of it, I feel like I mind. Oh, yeah? shit. You know? Uh, don't like, mind, I've don't just mind. Just become aware of it on this episode. Uh, it's kind of cool, like, though. Maybe I should find the thing that I want to pour all my energy in we're definitely n- like in a very specialized culture and time nowadays people need to have a niche i don't have a niche well if you are not putting energy into something or investing energy into something from fear that if your invested energy goes to waste uh-huh. then you're practicing through free fear but if you're just like you know, nonchalant, like, I don't care. I'm just existing, really. You sound at peace to me. Yeah, it if you're at peace and it doesn't come from fear, then you shouldn't worry about it. I mean, it's not out of fear. Maybe it's out of the wasted energy. Maybe it should. Maybe I should be channeling it into something. Hello, if I may, yeah. a choice is always more interesting. Yeah. Making a choice is always good, more interesting, good, good right? Good. Yeah. There is also value in not making choice that's that's a high level of acceptance in a way it's kind of flowy existence and it's not like it's getting in the way of life right it's not getting you in trouble you're not like broke because of it Mm. you're not you know struggling with your kids Mm. in fact the nichifying uh of of this like expectation from everyone is turning us into kind of insects where he's a, a really shiny beetle with a horn and someone else is a dragonfly and they're so nichified that they might never interact yeah with someone like you is uh, i don't want to paint a picture but it's like a worker ant who is part of a whole who is going with the rest of the ant colony and doing what's required and it's perfect right that ant doesn't need to have a specialization it's it's serving a perfect role and uh, I saw it in a way kind of like a sprinkler where it's not a channel containing that stream of energy like the topography I was talking about. Rather, it's a sprinkler. It's like rain where it's, it's going everywhere almost equally and that energy is e- emitted 
from you in all direction rather than laser focused at some def- yeah it's definitely all over and not laser focused i mean maybe every once in a while i'll tell i mean I, f- I feel like i've tangented from the podcast recording a bit <laughs> that i'm doing some self-discovery here but like every once in a while i'll focus myself on a project right. uh-huh. like okay. the podcast project yeah the podcast was a project ongoing it was good good one this one long journey, <laughs> like uh and then like for example there was a time like i took my daughter out of school and we did homeschool that was like a project I did uh, yeah, you yeah. know yeah, yeah. and then like i felt like the phd for me that's like a project like it's just like things that uh, uh, but they're all spaced out there's no long-term singular vision you you are the the connecting factor between those very separate different things you are the garden and in this garden you can have more than one tree you can have more than one kind of like you can have flowers where no one's going to eat the fruit of a flower, but it's a beautiful thing. I'm wondering why you think it's something that you should change is what I'm thinking. Hmm. Maybe I need a, maybe I need now ah. to refocus. Hello. It's time to focus. A yeah. new project, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like okay. I just finished with the whole making a baby project. I'm done with oh, that. yeah. You just got like that. now I'm projectless currently. Ah. Mm. Currently project list. That's a nice place to be. It's kind of scary though, right? Maybe, maybe it's time to double down on the hamburger generation project. <laughs> <laughs> and and double do patty. <laughs> and do some work. Yeah, yeah. Be nice to do some work. We're doing some work. Thank you so much for listening. Fun fact. Nidal is our first ever guest that crossed over and appeared on both podcasts that I personally run. The other one being the Poetry Hood podcast. So if you'd like to hear more from Nidal and about his art, philosophy and writing, find the Poetry Hood podcast on your favorite audio app. Thanks again for listening and we'll catch you on the flip side.